Our desire is that this message can lead you to a deep reflection on the processes and tools of self-transformation provided by the renowned Yog Sadhguru. If you want to start your yoga journey, together with Sadhguru, click the link in the description of this video and learn more. Visionary Women is a volunteer-run uh, organization, and I know that every single person who is here is giving their time to one organization or another. And the fact that you have nine million volunteers, and you were talking about the relationship between volunteerism and willingness, and that it's through willingness that you uplift your consciousness, if I'm quoting you correctly, or I'm understanding it. In some ways, talking about how it could be a doorway to becoming a bigger person than mm -hmm. who you are. See, uh, before we come to women, first thing is visionary. What a vision, and vision means is, see everybody has desires. Desire is an incre incremental way of enhancing our life. Today you desire, I must have a home, tomorrow you desire, I must have this money, tomorrow you desire something else. These are incremental ways of arranging and rearranging our lives, mm -hmm. which are needed to do a few things. When you say, I'm a visionary, what you're saying is, I have a larger desire, which is not about just incremental improvement of my life. Desire is about me always. Vision is an all-inclusive in, all process. So, this itself is a phenomenal thing. If people, instead of having desires, if they have a vision, mm -hmm. vision is always all-inclusive. Desire is personal. Desire leads to incremental changes and improvements. Vision can transform the whole situation. I like music <laughs> So, uh, about willingness, because you said you're a volunteer on this, to be a volunteer. A volunteer means somebody who is doing something willingly, right? There's no other compulsion. There are no financial compulsions, there are no social compulsions, there is no something else. You want to do something willingly. So when you're a willing participant right now, you're a volunteer. I'm asking all of you, right now, are you compelled to be here or are you here voluntarily? Oh, well, thank you <laughs> Because I've sp spoken to conscripted people also. I've spoken in the prisons, I've spoken in many places <laughs> So you're here willingly. You're doing something willingly is the fundamental of your joy, isn't it so? Hello? Yes. However simple or stupid or idiotic activity it is, I am doing something willingly, makes a world of difference, isn't it so? Hello? Yes. The difference between heaven and hell is just this, you are doing something willingly, that's your heaven. You are doing something unwillingly, that's your hell. Hmm? We have already taken on attitudes, what we like and what we don't like. I like this person, I don't like this person. Now with this person I will do things willingly, with this person I'll do things un unwillingly. This may be two people, two aspects of life, two mm -hmm. communities, two nations, two many things. This I will do willingly, this I do unwillingly. This means I've decided in my mind this is good, this is bad. When I hear even on national news channels, good guys and bad guys, it just… Once you have this kind of thing, you are going to be disastrous to the planet. It's just a question of time. The moment you decide this is a good person, this is a bad person, this has gone deep into American society. No, there are no good people and bad people. Everybody is oscillating between the two. If you create a very pleasant, wonderful atmosphere, everybody behaves wonderfully. If you create an unpleasant atmosphere, a whole lot of people act nasty. Mm -hmm. Yes or no? Yes. 
there are joyful people and miserable people, but there are no good people and bad people. The… the moment we think we are good, we are entitled to destroy the bad, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, we've been destroying a lot of people for a long time. Time to stop that <laughs> because human beings are in different levels of experience and understanding, variety of people. Anybody who is not like you is obviously bad, isn't it? <laughs> Isn't it so? Those who are not like me must be bad people. Because the basis of goodness and what you think is goodness is decided by you. No, you have no business to do that. Willing means this, I'm just willing. I'm a hundred percent yes to life. I am not yes to this one, no to this one, no. I am just yes and yes to life. If you are a hundred percent yes to life, you are a volunteer. Oh, that's you have become a willing life. You have become so willing that you have no will of your own. People ask me, Sadhguru, how do you operate with all these people? All kinds of horrible questions they're asking, they're doing this, they're doing that. I said, my life is not about them, it's about me. Mm. It's about how I am. It's about me. It doesn't matter how they are, that's their choice. But how I am is my choice, this is my way. No matter what they do, I'm like this. Because I have not given that freedom to anybody, that somebody can freak me, somebody can make me angry, somebody can make me happy, somebody can make me unhappy. These privileges I kept to myself. It's time you do that too. Because if somebody else can decide, what can happen within you right now? Isn't this the ultimate slavery? Huh? Isn't this? Someone else can decide what should happen within you. What happens around you, of course, so many people decide. Hmm? What happens around us is not hundred percent ours, but what happens within me must be my making, isn't it? Right now, just about anybody can freak anybody because they're not volunteers. They're unwilling. Mm -hmm. Volunteering means you have no will of your own. You can do whatever is needed. You know, we are a volunteer organization. This means uh, all kinds of people. <laughs> Most of them are not qualified for the jobs that they're doing. <laughs> and I cannot fire them because they're volunteers <laughs> <laughs> So people keep coming up to me on a daily basis, they say, Sadhguru, I can't work with this person, she's so horrible, I can't do it. I tell them, see, in this world, this is the sort of people who exist, like this, like this, like this, like this, this is the kind of people there are. But if you want to work with ideal people, you must go to heaven. <laughs> and today, Today. But if you think what you're doing is very significant, you must learn to work with all these horrible people. This is how the world is. If you think what you're doing is very significant, you learn to work with all kinds of people. You will see horrible people will do wonderful things. Yes? Yes. yes. But if you want to work with ideal people, you won't find any. I haven't found one yet. All kinds of mixed bags, yes. but <laughs> if you are willing that you are not yes and no, yes to one, no to another, you're simply one big yes, you will find a way. <laughs> Thank you so much. That I, I, I always say that it's the resistance <laughs> to life. Many problems that human beings are suffering is simply because we have lost that awareness as to how to be in sync with the many forces. If you become in rhythm with life, you will also wake up somewhere after 3 a.m. At that time, if you sit up and do whatever process you have been initiated for, it will bear maximum fruit.
in the way the planet is spinning and what is happening, something very fundamental changes somewhere between 320 to 340. This is called Brahma Mahurtam. This is relevant only up to 33 degrees latitude. Your system, human system, functions in a certain way. It is a possibility. So, uh, there has been an awareness about making use of this possibility. Your life is a product of many things that we call as the universe, many things that we call as existence. So, we are a consequence of a certain phenomenal happening that we call as cosmos. We are not an individual existence. So, when you get in sync, certain things will happen. You know, there's a <coughs> cicadius in uh, where we are in Tennessee, the U.S. ashram, they wake up once in seventeen years. Can you beat it? They know it is seventeen years and they come awake and they breathe and they go back to sleep. They're keeping time once in seventeen years, no alarm bell anywhere. Well, how is this? I'm saying they're in sync with nature. We have lost sync within nature and we think that is our nature. No. All the many ailments, many problems that human beings are suffering is simply because we have lost that awareness as to how to be in sync with the many forces which are making us who we are. So yoga is to bring that sync so that you are in rhythm with life. If you become in rhythm with life, you will also wake up somewhere just after three a.m. If you're conscious, suddenly a certain spark of aliveness will happen within you. Even if you're in deep sleep, you will come awake. This must happen to you. This means you're falling in sync with it. You're falling in sync with life. So what should I do? Should I meditate? Should I do a kriya? Doesn't matter what, you must do a process for which you have been initiated for. Because initiation means… Just do this one simple exercise. If you do this, you will live a worthwhile life, believe me. If you sleep in that condition, you will wake up with much more light, with much more energy. Generally, in India they told you, you should not put your head to the north and sleep. Hmm? You're aware of this? If you put your head to the north and sleep during the night when you… when you're in horizontal positions, then slowly the blood will get pulled towards your brain. When there's too much circulation in the brain, you cannot sleep peacefully. If you have any kind of, you know, inherently weak aspects in your brain or if you're of old age, you could die in your sleep. One can have hemorrhage because extra blood is trying to enter the brain where the blood vessels are hair-like. Something extra is being pushed because of the magnetic pull. When you're in a vertical position, this is not so. The moment you become horizontal, this pull on the head is so strong that slowly the blood tries to move towards the brain. So to avoid this, this is true only in the Northern Hemisphere. If you go to Australia, you should not put your head to the south. If you're in India, you should not put your head to the north. You can put it any other way, it's okay. You were not just thought a practice, it was introduced into your system, it was implanted in your system. So whatever, if there is a life seed within you, if you're awake at Brahma Mahartam and sit for whatever that practice is, it bears maximum fruit because 
of the way the planet is behaving in relation to your system. If you become aware in a certain way, a certain level of awareness is achieved within you, you will see, you will simply know when the time is. If you go to bed at the right time, you don't have to look at your watch. You will always know when it is 3.40 because the body will behave in a different way. At that time, if you sit up and do whatever process you have been initiated for, not what you picked up from a book, it will bear maximum fruit. The seed will get the necessary support at that time for it to sprout or spurt up more rapidly than, you, uh, than at other times. This is only for the initiated. If you are not initiated, you are a book yogi, then 3.40, 6.40, 7.40, not so much of a difference. Sandhya colors are more important for such people. Sandhya means twenty minutes before sunrise, twenty minutes after sunrise, or twenty minutes before sunset and twenty minutes after sunset. The same goes for noon and midnight, but they are of a different nature. So these two twilights are better for the uninitiated. 3.40 is good for those who have been powerfully initiated. You can incubate a lot of either negative things or positive things in sleep. This is getting too easy, just sleeping sadhana. So coming awake to an alarm bell with a sudden start is not the best way to do your life. How many of you find uh, that one day morning when you get up without any reason, you're just feeling ugly for no reason? If it is happening even at least two, three times a year, if it is, then you must do certain things before you go to bed. It's very, very important because unconsciously, you need to understand this, you can incubate a lot of either negative things or positive things in sleep. Either pleasantness or unpleasantness, you can incubate very effectively uninterrupted in sleep. You can also incubate it in the day, but there are so many interruptions, it doesn't happen very efficiently. But if you have a tendency to go to bed in a certain way and you wake up in the morning really nasty for simply no reason, that means you are incubating things in the night very efficiently. Bad eggs. This is not just about psychological disturbances, it can cause major physiological problems over a period of time. It's, it's important that you eliminate these things from your life. So before you go to bed in the night, there are certain things that you need to take care of. It's best if you're eating meat and other kinds of meals, you eat at least three to four hours before you go to bed. The digestion is over. Before going to bed, drink a certain amount of water and go to bed. You will see it gets taken care of just like this. One simple thing can be just a shower, always to shower before you go to bed, it'll make a lot of difference. In this weather, maybe cold showers are difficult, so you go for lukewarm showers, don't go for hot showers in the night, go for lukewarm showers, it makes you alert. So you will think, oh, I cannot sleep. It doesn't matter, you will sleep fifteen, twenty minutes or half an hour later, but you will sleep better because it will take away certain things. When you shower, 
it is not just the dirt on the skin that you're taking away. Have you noticed if you're very tense and anxious, whatever, just a shower, you came out and feels like almost the burden has been taken away from you? Have you not noticed this? So it's not just about washing the skin. A whole lot of things happen when water flows over your body. This shower is a very rudimentary bhuti shuddhi because over seventy percent of your body is actually water. If you run water over it, a certain purification happens which is beyond cleaning the skin. Keep this in your mind that you are truly a mortal, okay? Not in words, really, you could fall dead right now. Uh, you may be young, you may be old, it doesn't matter, you can fall dead right now. Yes or no? Before you go to bed, sit on your bed and think this is your deathbed. You have just one more minute to live. Just look back and see, what you have done today, is it worthwhile? Just do this one simple exercise and you don't know when it really happens, whether you'll be sitting on your deathbed or lying in a hospital, all kinds of things sticking into you, who knows how it'll happen. But enjoy this every day that you will sit on your deathbed, look back and see today, the way I've handled these twenty-four hours, is it worthwhile? Because now I'm dying. If you do this, you will live a worthwhile life, believe me. So every day in the night, all of you should do this before you go to bed. Last three minutes, everything that you have gathered, the body, the content of the mind, things, don't ignore small things, the small things are big things. I've seen how people are carrying their, their own private pillow, you know? <laughs> because it's very important. <laughs> so, your pillow, your footwear, if you have relationships, everything that you have gathered, keep it aside, sleep. If you sleep in that condition, you will wake up with much more light, with much more energy, with much more possibilities than you have imagined possible. Just sleep as life, not as a man, not as a woman, not as this and that. Keep everything down, simply. See, I'm, this is getting too easy. Just sleeping sadhana. Hmm? At least this you must do. I'm talking about attention, not even about something, just being attentive. In the yogic systems, we have what is called as dashavadanis, shatavadanis. What this means is, a man will do ten things at the same time. Now, when you don't miss a thing, everybody thinks you're some kind of a superhuman being. We can give you very uh, dynamic processes through which you can scale up your attention to a higher and higher level. One more thing if you want to do, you just light an organic oil lamp, a cotton wick, some oil, anything. What do you use here? Normal cooking oil linseed oil, rice bran oil or sesame oil, what do you have? Olive oil. Olive oil, fine. Any organic oil with a cotton wick, just burn a little lamp somewhere in the room where you sleep. You will see these things will completely disappear. If you can bring in a chant or there are nightly practices, yogic practices, before you go to bed, sit on your bed and do this practice. Do you know, in about… if you live for about sixty years, you're… on an average most human beings are eating anywhere between eleven hundred to fourteen hundred tons of food. So that means even what you think is my body is not this, it's changing every day. New input is happening and old things are going away. So fourteen hundred tons, you don't have to carry that much of weight right now. So obviously, what you have as a body right now is just a transient amount of food and soil, isn't it? Hello? So what you think is mine also is not it, it is just all the time changing. Tonight before you go to bed, spend at least twelve, fifteen minutes 
reminding yourself, you're neither this body nor this mind. Just lie down and just remind yourself, this body is not really you. It is mine right now for use, but it's not really me. Just… if you're not able to do it, just link it to your breath. Inhalation, I'm not the body. Exhalation, I'm not even the mind. Just lie down for twelve minutes and do it. Till the last moment, till you fall asleep. This is something you must notice. The question is, what means focus to you and which way can we apply focus in our daily life? So, what's your definition of focus? Okay. Yes, thanks. Uh, there are many ways to describe this word. Instead of saying focus, if you use the word attention, would you agree that attention and focus are about the same thing? There is a little difference. There is… there are nuances to it. But when you say focus, it's just like focusing a light on something means only a focus is always a spot. Attention can be much more widespread. See, right now, if you have clear vision, I am having problems seeing the young man because you kept him in darkness there in the hall <laughs> But if the hall was well lit, I don't have to focus myself to see the people who are sitting here. I just need attention. If I am attentive, I will see all the people here the way they are. But now I get interested in this one young man, then I need focus. If I had only focus without the general attention about everything around me, indiscriminate attention I am talking about, attention not even about something, just being attentive because only because there is a certain level of attention and awareness within you, you even know that you exist. Otherwise, let's say in sleep, in your experience, neither the world exists nor you exist, all that's happened is there is no attention, because there is no attention, there is no perception of any kind. 